Hello, my name is Callie Malcolm. I'm an Associate Professor of Art and Photography at the University of North Florida in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm excited to be able to share with you a presentation on black and white photography. Uh, for those of you who are photographers, you hold a tremendous amount of power. The images you make have the opportunity to shape our world, and what you create for your school becomes a part of your school's permanent record of the experiences of you and your classmates. Future yearbook and journalism students will look back on what you've made and they'll be able to better understand this time period and your experiences through those images. So you get to create that visual record and that is such a gift. So again, today I'd like to talk to you about black and white photographs and their usefulness in contemporary photography, uh, whether that is for journalistic photographs or fine art images, the conversation is the same. So for the record, I also love color photography. This talk is not meant to dissuade you from using color in your work, but I want to talk about why color might not always suit your shoe. So we're going to look at a lot of images today and I'll show you both color and black and white. And I'll talk about how our work changes in the eye of the viewer based on our decisions as image makers. So it may seem strange that at a time where color photographs can so accurately reflect the world around us that we'd even have a conversation about black and white imagery. Color imagery can ignite our imagination and consume our senses. And color can remind us that what is happening within the image is happening right now. In images like this, color gives the image immediacy. The coronavirus pandemic is happening now, not 30 years ago, and color is one of the cues that allows us to know when something happened. Among a number of things like point of view, composition, subject and framing, the color in this photograph brings us the story of civil disobedience and the police response to it in Hong Kong in 2019. While so many current events are happening in far-flung places, color is one element of the photograph that reminds us that the news is happening today, that our world is small, and that we have to address issues on a global level, not just a local one. Color can also add whimsy and carry us to imaginary places. And it can arrest our vision and draw us into a simple image for closer inspection. But just as the invention of digital photography led to a sort of renaissance or increased popularity of 19th and 20th century processes, the sheer volume of color imagery that saturates our experience, fills our newsfeed and graces the pages of our magazines doesn't crowd out the black and white image. Rather, the dominance of color images serves to underline well-made, well-placed black and white photographs. Sometimes it's in the lack of color that we can find power in photography. So what is it about the black and white photograph that is so powerful exactly? Photographer Elliot Erwitt is an American who was born in Paris in 1928. He's a magnum photographer. And to Erwitt, he suggests that color is descriptive and that black and white is interpretive. So what does that mean? Uh, for Erwitt, black and white images can move the viewer to make associations and connections that are independent of mere description. When you look at his body of work, he is concerned with humanity, relationships, and the human condition. He's also a ride or die black and white shooter. So here's an image called Colorado 1955. Um, in this image and the next one from Serbia in 1967, color film was around, but it was expensive to shoot. It was expensive to process, expensive to print, and the quality wasn't particularly great, certainly not by today's standards. So though color film was getting there, it couldn't meet the cost and quality demands of professional photographers. So by necessity and ease, photographers like Elliot Erwitt shot in black and white. Fast forward a few decades, this is New York City in the year 2000. Uh, color is far more accurate and cost effective Elliot Erwitt and other like him, though, continue to shoot in black and white. For Erwitt, black and white erases time. It doesn't rely on the spectacle and bombast of rich color. By stripping out color, we are left with a set of tones and values that force us to analyze the imagery a little differently. We interpret meaning and symbolism in less concrete, descriptive terms. And Erwitt recognized that his style of working was best understood in a set of tones rather than hues. So that's why he shoots black and white. All right, so that guy still shoots black and white. Big deal, right? He's been around forever, and um, he started when black and white was 
um, the only option, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at a photographer who's photograph, who photographs in color and black and white, both depending on the shoot. This is um, Annie Leibovitz. She was born in 1949. Uh, Leibovitz is perhaps the most famous living photographer. And while she engages in personal work, she has long been a photographer for publications like Rolling Stone Magazine, Vanity Fair, and Vogue. And here is a cover shoot shot by Leibovitz. It features Mr. and Mrs. Bieber. I almost know who those people are. And here's the Vanity Fair Hollywood shoot from 2018. It features, I don't know, all the famous people all at once in here. And you can see sort of the opulence of the design of her photographs um, and in how color operates in much of her work. It's pretty cool. And here's an older cover that she did for Rolling Stone. It was shot by Leibovitz. Um, some of you may have seen this image before. It's a cover image of Yoko Ono and Beatles legend John Lennon. Um, in the olden days, uh, photographers would make a Polaroid image before shooting film in order to test light and composition. After the shoot with Ono and Lennon, Leibovitz showed them the Polaroid test shot and John Lennon looked at it and he said, you've captured our relationship exactly. This image was made on December 8th, 1980, and it was made about five hours before John Lennon was tragically shot and killed. Uh, the image itself is packed with intensity already, uh, but now it is loaded further by the history of that day. The loss of Lennon a few hours after the shoot makes this the final image we have of him. And what a blessing that he was able to see it and that he, uh, he also liked the photograph, right? So why show Leibovitz? Leibovitz has a tremendous budget um, to make her work. She has a host of assistants to realize her vision. She often orchestrates over-the-top editorial shoots of celebrities. Um, can you turn a celebrity into an octopus? I certainly can't. You can't either, but Annie can. So there's relevance to me showing you someone whose budget and, um, and opportunities sort of outlast ours presently. It's not that we will never be the Leibowitz of tomorrow, but we are not now. Um, but there's a reason we look at her, because while she has budgets like that and she can do whatever she wants, occasionally she strips stuff back to uh, clean lines, relatively minimal color, etc. So she's even photographed Queen Elizabeth. I happen to really like showing this image because it's a good transitional photograph between the opulent and over-the-top sets for covers and um, also the ones I'm about to show. But I also love this image of a queen with a moody late fall dusk in the background. I think it speaks to the tumult and incredible change Queen Elizabeth has presided over in the course of her long reign. Uh, but you know, back to the photographs. Leibowitz will occasionally elect to strip her sets and subjects down to the bare essentials. She doesn't have to, again, she has that budget, it's robust. Um, but let's take a look at some of those stripped down images and you can understand the power of a strong black and white photograph. So here we have Nelson Mandela. Um, in the works I'm about to show, Leibowitz relies on the subject and lighting to advance the story. She relies on the formal elements of light and dark to inform the viewer and elicit a mood. These images that seem quieted by the lack of intense color become powerful in the absence of it. The truth of the matter is that color can sometimes distract. When we produce images in black and white, some interesting things can begin to happen. One is that you'll see the effects of light differently. In this image of Mick Jagger, the recessed lights in the elevator seem to hover over him like UFOs. The lighting adds to the strangeness of an image that depicts a rock god in an elevator in a bathrobe with a towel on his head. The strangeness of the light quality, the location, and the wardrobe are wonderful. We don't picture celebrities having to do regular things like bathe or push an elevator button. And we don't think of rockers like Mick Jagger having to listen to canned elevator music as they are ushered from floor to floor. Leibowitz's image forces us to think about those things. The intense strangeness of the photograph forces us to confront the strangeness of celebrity. And she's really very good at, um, at making those correlations. Here's one of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Black and white imagery amplifies shape and form, and in an image like this, it amplifies the subject while de-emphasizing the background. So a little note on composition. This image is technically composed all wrong. 
The left edge sits right on the horse's face. The right edge bumps up against his patoot. There's little negative space on the top and bottom edges of the frame as well. Normally you wanna have some breathing room around the edges because without it, it can cause some anxiety and discomfort for the viewer. So what's up with this one? Leibowitz knows rules of composition for sure. She is very well trained and she knows when to break them. This is an older picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger from when he was a professional bodybuilder. By putting him on a white horse, she's suggesting that he is the knight in shining armor. He's the rescuer. She's also shooting him from slightly below pointed upward, which tends to monumentalize the subject and causes them to seem confident and important. To add to that, she creates a really tight crop that suggests the magnetism of this man and his charisma, that when Arnold Schwarzenegger is in the room, he takes up all the space in that room while he's present. So these are all clever decisions by a pretty clever photographer for sure, but let's get back to the black and white of it all, shall we? So black and white can carry emotion differently than color images. And I think we can see that here too. Some of it is uh, with the shallow depth of field um, where the grasses in the background are a little bit blurred. And here we've got Leonardo DiCaprio draped in a swan. And I have to tell you, if you ever have an opportunity to drape a swan around someone, you should take that opportunity. It creates an incredible photo. And it also allows us to focus on things like surface quality of skin and musculature. Uh, this is rocker Iggy Pop, who has a lot of interesting textures in his skin and musculature. And the black and white photo, along with the style of lighting, really amplifies those things. And it also erases time, and it pushes an image closer to history rather than present. Um, here's sculptor Louise Bourgeois, um, who became famous a little bit later in her life. If you're ever in a major art museum and you see a really large scale sculpture of a spider, that may be one of hers. Um, the spiders represent her mother, by the way, but we won't go there. So sticking with Leibowitz for a little bit longer, here we have two images, one in color and one in black and white. Both photographs are undeniably beautiful and both photographs depict ballet dancers. But I would argue that they are otherwise very different images. They evoke different emotions. They carry different focal points and meanings. So let's dig in a little bit here with these. In this initial image, we see hues of champagne yellow and peachy pink. Um, they tend to push us into an imaginary realm like the storybook. Uh, the figures become characters in a broader story about romance and they have a fairy tale quality. The work is not meant to be descriptive of dancing, it is using dancers to tell a story. And then moving on to this image, it works a little differently. It evokes emotion through light and shadow for sure. It uh, evokes those emotions through isolation as well. This image doesn't create a fanciful imaginary tale. It is an image about this individual. It's about athleticism and concentration. It is introspective and descriptive. It is ripe for interpretation, but it's free of the constructs of time. It is powerful and dynamic, but it's also really very quiet. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit. I think it's important to talk about a practical reason why practitioners have often used black and white for commercial news and print publications. That just makes sense. Here we have a cover image of Rolling Stone. The cover image is of Lady Gaga, photographed by David LaChapelle. So if you enjoy color photography, celebrity culture, and critiques of consumerism, then David LaChapelle is totally your guy. Similar to Leibowitz, he enjoys massive budgets and access to very famous stars. Uh, his style is different from Leibowitz, however, and you can see that if you compare the two. So uh, there's something really about La Chapelle's images, really all of them. Um, they make them, he makes them seem like a little bit wet or a little bit sticky, and he's kind of a weird guy and a tremendously gifted image maker. Anyway, this is an 09 cover shoot for Rolling Stone. We know it's a contemporary image for a number of reasons. First of all, it's Lady Gaga, and she's a contemporary star. Uh, there's a date listed on the magazine, which is also a clue, and Gaga lacks a certain amount of clothing, uh, which is acceptable today, but would be considered unacceptable in bygone eras. So putting all of those clues aside, this image carries the mark of its time due to the quality of the cover. Color printing has advanced to the point that it very closely resembles our world accurately. This hasn't always been the case, and color images from early eras tend to show signs of their age. So here's another group of relatively recent Rolling Stone covers. While each photographer elicits a slightly varied style in terms of lighting, 
pose, coloration. For the most part, these look uniform in terms of color. The skin tones are accurate, the light quality shifts, uh, but it's within a relatively uniform range. We have Taylor Swift photographed in a bright high key light and with little shadow. Meanwhile, Jay-Z's image in the bottom right embraces a bit of shadow and um, he's photographed with a pretty traditional butterfly lighting setup. The image of Stevie Nicks is a classic. The color is warm and rich and she enjoys soft highlights and soft shadows. So while these images do vary in lighting strategies, the color is accurate and accurate to the style of today. Okay, so I'd like to analyze the Stevie Nicks cover a little bit more. This is not the first time her image has graced the cover of Rolling Stone. She was also photographed in 1981. And here's that cover. So the difference is kind of shocking, right? This is a prime example of how color can cause your images to be trapped within a certain time period. Through the decades, the shifts in color in Rolling Stone have been pretty dramatic, and I'm going to show you those now. So here are some of the screenshots from a project called Cover Wall. Uh, it was on the Rolling Stone website for, for a few years, and it allowed us to scroll through the decades and look at all of their covers. Uh, they removed it and allegedly put it on Google Play, but I can't figure that out with that newfangled technology. So to me, it's, it's gone now. Um, if, you can, if you can look that up, it's called Cover Wall, and I think you'd like to scroll through it. So this is 1976. We have a group of cover color covers, but the tones lack a firm relationship to reality. This is uh, really a result of the technology of the time, be it the printing technology and quality of the paper or the film technology. Needless to say, it looks wildly different from the contemporary images I just showed. So uh, the images are vintage and cool, but they definitely are not color accurate. And here's 1980. The skin tones are getting better, but we still have muddiness in the hues overall as a result of the technology. And here's 1990. We see it, uh, it was a time of less uniformity in both the style of the photographs and the look of the, the color and the covers. Uh, the Janet Jackson image is interesting. It's a sepia toned one rather than strict black and white or strict color. The moving right along. So this is 1995. In 1995, we see the great democratization of digital photography. A lot of people were able to access those types of cameras, and there was the huge shift going on in photography generally. So um, when digital photography and digital technology really started to take off, um, I spoke a little bit at the beginning of the talk about how new technology in photography can lead to a renaissance of older processes or looks. And that's what happened at this time. So this is a good example. The rise of digital is happening, um, yet three of the eight covers shown are in monochrome. Two are, two are black and white, and one has the brown and cream sepia treatment that references analog and film-based processes. I think it's pretty interesting. So here's 2005 when accurate color is favored. We have the Hunter S. Thompson cover and another issue that are appropriately black and white due to their subject matter. Thompson had died that year and this was a memorial issue. And then um, the image of the immortals issue uh, is in black and white. And basically a rule you can always count on is that if you're photographing anything immortal, it should be done in black and white. So um, there's a tip. And finally, here is 2013. This is the last year of the Rolling Stone cover wall. Um, it's subtle, but there is a difference between 05 and 2013. During this time, we see a shift away from the warmer toned or accurate images and a move toward lower vibrance and cooler toned images. So the Dylan and Michael J. Fox covers are a great example of what was trendy in photography at that time, where things lead more blue than they do yellow. And these are from our covers from 2019, uh, where we are trending back toward realistic color within the long running magazine. So that's a good end cap to sort of, sort of show where we were at least last year. Okay, so Rolling Stone magazine prides itself on being a bellwether for contemporary culture. They utilize new technology within their pages and the images from 1976 or 1985 are definitely a product of their time. Uh, they were contemporary and Rolling Stone will continue to be a product of our time so long as they're in print. Occasionally, this wildly successful and always cutting edge publication will hop into the Wayback Machine and display their cover artists in black and white rather than color. And here we have an Eminem cover from 2004. And here 
are the black keys from 2012. So we've talked about the problem with color firmly situating photographs within a time period. It's hard to escape that effect, but with black and white photography, we can time hop. It has a leveling effect on the chronology of rock and roll. Suddenly, Eminem and the black keys can be compared to Johnny Cash. The bands through their Rolling Stone covers get sort of adopted into the history books right up there with Elton John. They're given a sort of legitimacy and a suggestion of musicians whose work will last forever, like the Beatles. They're put on the same le uh, level as Bob Dylan, so not too shabby, right? We should all long to be depicted in black and white. It gives us a sort of immortality, or at least that's what we can tell ourselves. But we're all like Dylan, aren't we? Okay, so whew, there's a great TED talk by Phil Hansen called Embrace the Shake. I highly recommend checking it out. What Hansen talks about in, is the power that limitation can have. So he speaks about a nerve condition that caused his hand to chronically shake, which disrupted his ability to create really careful and precise drawings, which are what he was known for. So he tried to find a solution to his ailment, but he received the advice from his doctor that rather than view it as a limiter to success, that he should simply embrace the shake. The moral of his story is that by self-imposing limitations, you will find that you are pushed creatively in interesting ways. So what might happen if you give yourself an assignment where you will only produce images in black and white for a week? You might be surprised at the results. So what I would like to do, rather than show you really famous photographers, um, I'd like to show you photographers who are former students of mine and who have made really interesting, really captivating um, black and white work using modest budgets. They do not have uh, the Leibowitz budget by any stretch, right? So I think it's helpful to look at some of those images too. So how might that impact your work if you embraced a limitation and chose to only shoot in black and white for a week? You may find it to be a challenge. Uh, imagining your image in black and white will change how you view your subject and how you view your world. Not every project should be produced in black and white, just like not every image should be produced in color. So how do you know the difference? I have some work here again by my students that illustrate the power of black and white um, as a, a genre of photography. So while you will likely photograph with the digital camera and have the option of color. Some of these first students were limited to black and white because they were photographing on film and using the traditional black and white darkroom. They didn't have the option of color. Others were given the option, but they decided the subject matter was most suitable in black and white. Now, I think this work is just pretty beautiful. Uh, the access to different groups my students have had over the years is pretty intense and oh look at that reflection on the water and i've got a couple more here yeah such moody awesome work the lighting's just amazing in all of these okay so let's do a case study so i've shown you some awesome images in black and white but uh what dictates color versus black and white Let's talk about that. So how do you know if you should use black and white instead of color? It's a really tricky question. The most famous artsy fartsy answer is that if something works, it works. And if it doesn't, you should change it. And while that statement is absolutely true, it's not very helpful. So hopefully this case study will show you one example of when black and white was absolutely the answer. And sometimes just experimenting and, and trying different things on, different approaches to editing uh, can really help resolve how to optimize your images best. But let's look at these. So this last group of images I'll show you today are meant to give you an example of how to identify a situation where black and white imagery works far better than color. This group of images are a part of a project my former student Garrett Milanovic made during a study abroad program to Italy in 2016. He likes to shoot street scenes, action shots, and other commercially viable genres, and he's really good at it. He continues to be um, an active image maker today. In this project, he created some excellent street scenes in Italy. More specifically, the scenes are from Florence, Rome, and Naples, those three cities. And the images are pretty great. Garrett has a keen eye for composition and framing. He finds curious subjects to shoot, and he's brave in his approach where he doesn't mind if he gets busted taking somebody's picture. And that's the mark of a really great street photographer, someone who, um, who can handle that pressure of, of being seen when they're clicking the shutter button. Um, and he's fond of juxtaposing blurred motion and sharp subjects to create the visual sense of a bustling urban center. He makes really great work. 
as individual images, these are all pretty successful, right? They all have excellent exposure. The tonal range is awesome. The color is exciting in a lot of the images um, and the lighting is always quite nice. But when you put them together in a series, and that was his project was to make a series of images, there's a slight problem. The images remain dynamic and interesting as individual images, but they didn't have cohesion or enough unity as a group when he, when he assembled a photo essay or series, that lack of cohesion was a killer. And so he tried something, he flipped them into black and white and let's check out the difference. The individual images remain strong because they were well made to begin with. Some of them, like this one, make me a little bit sad because the purple glow of the gas station lights were so powerful in the original version, but he can use that color version in another set somewhere else. But as a group, the black and white served to unify the series a little bit better than the color. So that's what he rolled with. And here's that last one. And let's look at them all in the group. So uh, here we see the final result of his endeavor. In the end, converting from color to black and white created a cohesion necessary to unify his photo series. That one choice made all the difference between a successful photographic series and one that just didn't quite work well. Um, the images were always stunning, but, um, but he needed that unifying effort. And that happened when he flipped them into black and white. So I'd like to conclude today with some tips when considering black and white for your work. First, try pre-visualizing the image in black and white. Is there enough natural contrast in there? Think about the line in the scene, the shadow, the highlight, uh, the shapes, volumes, forms, etc. Does your image have natural contrast? With black and white in particular, you must have a clean black tone and a clean white tone almost always in order for the image to have visual pop. Um, be sure your image has that neutral contrast and tonality. As with all images, exposure is super critical as well. Lighting is the difference maker in photography. Um, interestingly, interesting lighting will elevate your work to new levels, whether you work in color or black and white. So I think it's one of the key elements in photo generally. Um, and then also when to use black and white. One last tip uh, that I give you begrudgingly because I'm certain you will always make beautiful photographs in really amazing lighting with perfect exposure and you'll captivate or you'll capture important moments. Um, so when you use black and white, one last tip is that it can cover up a few sins in photography. So if you do have some issues with poor exposure, flat lighting, uh, working in black and white can help de-emphasize those trouble areas. It can't always fix them, um, but it can turn a struggling image into an acceptable one. Um, so again, it may not work all of the time and it's certainly better to start with a solid foundation, but occasionally you can save an otherwise doomed photograph uh, by trying it in black and white. So to conclude, I encourage you to explore the absence of color, see how it changes the way you view the, uh, your world and your subject, explore how black and white photographs can erase a sense of time and place and make your work more universal. So I'd like to thank you uh, for your time and thank you for listening. I hope this was helpful and hope you think about images in a new way. And I'm gonna try to stop this. Okay.